Chapter 7 of William of Tyre's book is titled Why the Enemy Became More Powerful Against the Christians. As the name suggests, the entire chapter is dedicated to the turnaround in Levant, which now favoured the Muslims. For those who don't recognise the name, William of Tyre was a medieval archbishop who lived in the era. In fact, he lived in Altermir and even got to know some of the significant figures in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Although he died roughly one year before the Battle of Hattin, he lived long enough to witness the Kingdom of Jerusalem in periods of strength and decline, and he attributes three key reasons for the change in circumstances. In this video, we will analyze the reasoning that William of Tyre puts forward for the Muslims' victory over the Crusaders. But before we start, please remember to click like and subscribe, and to turn on notifications. This would really help the channel. Jazakallahu khairan. He begins the chapter with an interesting observation by stating, The question is often asked, and quite justly, why it was that our fathers though less in number, so often bravely, withstood in battle the far larger forces of the enemy, and that often by divine grace, a small force destroyed the multitudes of the enemy, with the result that the very name of Christian became a terror to nations. He then goes on to say the following, in contrast to this, the men of our times too often have been conquered by inferior forces. In fact, when with superior numbers, they have attempted some exploit against adversaries less strong. However, their efforts have been fruitless and they have usually been forced to succumb. Here, William of Tyre is comparing the victories during the First Crusade to the recent losses, and one can understand his point of view. The Christians during the First Crusade had been the underdogs. They were venturing into unknown Islamic territory and were up against the Seljuk Rum, the Great Seljuk Empire, and the Abbasid Caliphate. And yet, none of these empires were able to inflict any decisive victory against the Crusaders. Worst of all, when the Atabag of Musa al Karbugha arrived to confront the Franks at Antioch, he had been humiliated by an army whose size was clearly inferior. For many decades, the Crusaders did seem invincible, and the chronicler Ibn Qalanisi suggests that the fear of them may have begun as early as when the Crusaders took Nicaea from the Seljuk al Rum. So, how did things change so dramatically? Let's have a look at William of Tyre's first reason. Reason 1. The Decline of Christianity This may seem absurd considering the era, but Tyre suggests that the earlier generations had been more faithful towards Christianity, stating, our forefathers were religious men and feared God. This is followed by an attack on the current younger generation, which goes as the following. Now in their places a wicked generation has grown up, sinful sons, falsifiers of the Christian faith who run the course of all unlawful things without discrimination. According to Tyre, this was particularly apparent from within the Christians who lived in the East. Again, for many of us, this may seem absurd considering the era, so is there any evidence to this? There was a peculiar conversation he had with the king al marek one of the later kings of Jerusalem, which does deserve particular attention. 
Here, Tyre narrates the following conversation he had with the king. He, and here he is referring to King Amrek, asked me, in short, whether outside of the teaching of the Saviour and the holy men who followed Christ and the doctrines, which he did not doubt, was there any way of proving by reliable and authoritative evidence that there was a future resurrection. Here, William of Tyre confirms that the king did believe in the doctrine of the Bible, but this is a contradiction in itself because by his own admission, the king doubted the idea of an afterlife. William of Tyre then narrates that he had informed the king of the following. The teaching of our Lord and the Redeemer is sufficient, for in many passages of the Gospel, he plainly teaches the future resurrection of the body. However, Amalrek would respond with, I firmly believe all this, but I seek a reason whereby this can be proved to the one who doubts these things and does not accept the doctrine of Christ and believe in a future resurrection and that there is another life after this death. William of Tyre then goes on to say that he eventually convinced him, but did he really? It is not befitting of the king of Jerusalem to speak in this manner and if the king was a common example of the generation rather than an exception, then there had been a decline of attitude towards Christianity from within Altermere. Moving on, Tyre cites poor military discipline for his next reason. Just like previously, Tyre begins by making a comparison between the earlier generation of crusaders with the current. He writes that the first generation had been accustomed to military discipline. They were trained in battle and familiar with the use of weapons. However, the younger generation who had become too used to peace and inactivity eventually became enervated. They were unused to the art of war, unfamiliar with the rules of battle and gloried in their state of inactivity, and therefore it was not strange in number for men of war to overcome them. Essentially, Tyre alleges that unlike those who took part in the First Crusade, the current generation of Crusaders were not used to warfare and lacked military discipline, and therefore they could not match the more accustomed Muslims. It's difficult to suggest who he is referring to here, be it the general sense, the kings, or the Knight Templars, etc. However, there is enough evidence to suggest that Altermir suffered from incompetent leaders and disastrous decision making, which began arguably since the fall of Edessa, namely the Siege of Damascus in 1148 Common Era and the more baffling invasion of Egypt in 1168 Common Era. The outcome for both expeditions created the vacuum for the greatest rivals, the Zengids, to take over, when there had been no genuine threat from either. In fact, the invasion of Egypt eventually led for the rise of Salah ad-Din in Cairo. Furthermore, the higher up in the Kingdom of Jerusalem began to feud regarding who should succeed King Baldwin IV. This eventually led Raymond of Tripoli to turn to Salah ad-Din for protection. As for Salah ad-Din, who could not believe the sheer naivety of this individual, took advantage by requesting his armies to pass through his territories in preparation for Hattin, which of course, Raymond begrudgingly accepted. And speaking of which, they made a complete mess in preparation for the Battle of Hattin itself, which only provides further evidence for their military incompetence. Finally, Reason 3, the rise of great and capable Muslim leaders. For this, Tyre writes, Those who feared their own allies not less than the Christians could not or would not readily unite to repulse the common danger 
or arm themselves for our destruction. But now, since God has so willed it, all the kingdoms adjacent to us have been brought under the power of one man. Here, Tyre now makes the comparison between the Ummah's previous state and its leaders to the current. Previously, the Ummah had been divided and feared the Crusaders. However, the Muslims were now united on the Salah ad din and surrounded Jerusalem. He then goes on to mention three men in particular who might to turn the tide to the Muslims' favor. The first mentioned is Ahmad al-Din Zengi, to whom he refers to as a monster who abhorred the name of Christian as he would a pestilence. Zengi is usually the man credited for laying the foundation of the anti-crusader movement. Tyre appears to acknowledge this and the significance of the fall of Edessa, which many historians today believe was the turning point. Next, he moves on to Nuruddin, the son of Zengi. He mentions his success in taking Damascus and how his greatest lieutenant Shirko took Egypt which of course, played a big role in turning the tide. To add to this, Nuruddin's piety is well documented and he's often credited for initiating the Sunnification in Levant, in places it had been absent. For those who have not watched our video on this great man, we will leave a link of it in our description of this video. Going back to Tyre, Nuruddin's piety is something that William of Tyre also concedes to. In another chapter, he refers to Nuruddin as a prudent man and a man who feared God. He then moves on to Salah ad din and mentions the might that he had under his rule, how all the kingdoms around about us obey one ruler and that they do the will of one man and at his command alone, however reluctantly. They are ready, as a unit, take up arms for our injury. He then tries to downplay Salah ad dins success, suggesting he had been lucky to inherit what Zengi Nuruddin and his uncle Shirko had carved for him. But I disagree. Salah ad din took part in the conquest of Egypt himself and the country which he inherited had been in a terrible state and the Zengid territory which he had reunited was divided after the death of Nuruddin. Hence, it still required a lot of work for Salah ad din to establish himself and to reunite the land of Islam once again. Back to Tyre, he mentions his inestimable supply of purest gold, which Allah Hadin could now use to recruit a numberless companies of horsemen and fighters. Finally, when addressing his own people, he makes the priority for the Crusaders to commit to every possible effort be made to oppose this magnificent man in his swift progress through successive triumphs to the highest pinnacle of his ambition. Now, William of Tyre would die shortly after finishing this chapter. Thus, he would not witness the Battle of Hattin or the fall of Jerusalem. As mentioned earlier, Salah ad din would successfully recapture Jerusalem for the Muslims one year after the death of Tyre. So, what can we conclude? Firstly, from the chapter, we're left with the impression that Tyre now believes that the Kingdom of Jerusalem has reached the point of no return, that it is now inevitable for Jerusalem to fall, despite his best efforts to rally the Crusaders against Salah ad din Going back to his actual reasoning, however, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the Quran that victory comes from him, 
For example, he reveals in chapter Ar-Rum, At the victory willed by Allah, he gives victory to whoever he wills, for he is the Almighty Most Merciful. But as for the means for victory to occur that we can analyze on the dunya, then there is actually a lot that I would agree with Tyron here. If we're focusing strictly on the events in Levant, it was the Crusaders who were now committing heavy blunders on the battlefield and showing signs of division. More importantly, the Muslims now had far more capable leaders than they did previously. Gone are the days of Ridwan and Dukak. Instead, the Ummah had capable military commanders in charge, in the likes of Zengi, Nur al-Din and Salah al-Din. The latter two in particular also re-established Orthodox Islam in areas that it had been absent. This is not to say the Ummah had been permanently fixed by the end of Salah al-Din's reign, which is often a misconception. The Seljuks and the Caliph would continue to show little interest in supporting the Ayyubids, and the Europeans would continue to involve themselves in crusades until problems began to occur in Europe itself, and they eventually punched themselves out. In reality, it was only until the Mamluks established themselves on the scene when you can make the argument that the Ummah as a whole was truly safe from outside expeditions. If you like this video, please remember to like, share and subscribe and do remember to check out some of the other videos we have on the channel. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.